Okay, very good. Um, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or whatever time zone you're in. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, um, I wanted to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to give lectures. Um, I also wanted to shame them for putting me first. How come <laughs> you put me in this spot? No, it's fine. Um, but this is the first time uh, I'm actually giving lectures uh, in this um, setup, in this Zoom setup, in this virtual setup. Uh, so all of you as participants are a little bit of guinea pigs um, just to try to see how this goes. So this is going to be a learning experience for me as much as it's going to be a learning experience uh, for you. Uh, but okay, but I wanted to, before I go into the details of stuff, uh, I kind of wanted to have an impression of who am I talking to, at least uh, within the Zoom uh, platform. And also for you guys to maybe, if you have never used the raise hand feature, uh, you can use it now. So maybe, uh, could you raise your hand if you're a postdoc? I see one hand raised. Nobody else is supposed to have two hands raised. Okay. Let's see, I'll just wait another second to see if someone else raises their hand. Okay, so that's a fraction of people that are postdocs. Very good, you can lower your hand now. Thank you. Okay, how many of you are PhD students? Oof, okay, <laughs> vast majority of PhD students. Uh, that's great. Okay, uh, let me just wait. Oh, you lowering your hand. Okay, fine. Um, let's see. Okay, and then uh, lower your hand now, all PhDs, assuming that all of you had a chance to raise your hand. Um, and how many of you are master students? Uh, is there any master students right now listening to the lectures? So I see one hand, okay, um, very good. And if I missed, if you're neither um, a postdoc nor a PhD nor a master student, uh, feel free to share in the chat uh, what is your uh, current uh, status or position. But this gives me a little bit of information so the, uh, of what the level is a little bit. Uh, and I guess most of you will be doing, uh, will are P at the level of PhDs. Okay, so let's get started uh, with these lectures uh, because I'm most certainly going to run out of time, but maybe not, uh, who knows. So let's, uh, let's start. So I hope uh, if you can't see something or if you don't see changes on the screen for a long time and you think that I'm writing, uh, please let me know because sometimes the interface freezes and I want to make sure that you're not missing uh, what I'm actually writing on my iPad at this moment. Uh, so yeah, and if, if you think the handwriting is also not big enough, you can also, it's like when we use a blackboard, right? You can tell me, hey, write bigger. We can't see or something along those lines. Okay, very good. So let's start. I wanted to first uh, start these uh, lectures by giving some overview and a little bit of like, what is my mission? Uh, because my title on purpose was a little bit extremely uh, <laughs> vague and uh, abstract. And so when you say that you're going to be talking about ADS3 CFT2, I could be talking about 3000 different things, uh, which all fall under this um, umbrella. Um, but okay, but so I first want to kind of tell you a little bit from which perspective we're going to be discussing ADS3 CFT2. And for that, the first thing that I'll tell you is what I am going to uh, assume about your knowledge. So if you don't know some of these things, uh, feel free to ask for more references uh, on the Slack um, workspace and I'll give you more detailed references. I do have a file with, uh, we'll go through it a little bit on that list of references on which I'm basing this uh, lectures, but if, you, if that's still not enough and you have some uh, prior knowledge gaps, uh, please let me know. So what I'm going to assume, because I'm not going to review it, I'm just going to use it. I'm going to assume that all of you have some understanding of black hole thermodynamics. So basically, if I write an equation like this, you'll know 
have some context of what this means that the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is A over four. I'm also going to assume that there's some uh, basic aspects uh, of conformal field theories that are understood. So I'm not going to I'm not going to explain many of these things. Some of them, if I find them technically more advanced or too specific, I, I will uh, try to explain them uh, for the context of the lecture. But uh, many things I will assume that you already know, and in particular, um, I will assume that you all have some basic knowledge, some basic aspects of 2D CFTs. Okay, so this I'm not going to uh, review. And, and in general, like something, this is not going to be an introduction to ADS-3 CFT2. So I'm also going to assume some general knowledge on ADS CFT. Um, if you don't know anything about ADS CFT, then it might be a little bit difficult to follow these lectures, uh, but I'm happy to give you uh, references on this, but uh, this is going to be a bit uh, my starting point. Okay, so all of you are familiar with ADS CFT, the basic thing. So what are basic things about ADS CFT that I'm going to assume? Um, so, so the basic, like at the minimum, uh, as more as you know, it better will be, but at the minimum, as we discuss this correspondence, uh, I'm going to have in mind that you know some basic entries of the dictionary. So you know that if you have, for instance, let's say this list is not going to be exhaustive, but just so to give you a flavor of what I'm expecting, uh, that if you have a gauge symmetry in ADS, that will correspond to a global symmetry in the CFT. Uh, if you have fields in ADS, you have some understanding on how they're mapped to basically operators in the conformal theory uh, and the class, like the sort of distinct property of this correspondence is that as you take it, the classical limit, or I should say semi-classical limit in ADS, this corresponds to Toft limit in the CFT, what people colloquially call like large N limit. Okay, and this will be crucial as we go along. Uh, so, so this basically, this last entry is the one that tells us that when one side of the correspondence is weak, the other side of the correspondence is strongly coupled. Okay, so that's the picture that we're going to have and, and the cartoon that we'll usually be drawing uh, about ADS CFT is that we have in mind a space time that will look like this. So AD, the theory of ADS quantum gravity lives here in what we call the bulk and the CFT is at the boundary, okay? So this picture will come in time and time again. So, okay, so as, uh, as an ADS CFT person or as a, as a holographer, uh, what is the current view of holography? or the lore. So in the, the slogan, the, the selling point uh, of ADS CFT is that this correspondence basically provides for us a non-perturbative and UV complete definition of quantum gravity in AES, okay? That's the promise. That's why we're all excited. Oh, well, that's why I'm excited about ADS CFT, okay? It gives me uh, a definition of what quantum gravity in ADS is. Now, um, in this context, we know uh, the things that we understand about uh, the duality. It's that there are conditions So as we phrase this duality and as we use it, uh, there are conditions on a CFT uh, such that it captures semi-classical gravity. 
So one of this is, for instance, this large n limit. Okay, so this is kind of like the, the sort of like the very broad sort of overview of this that I have a non perturbative UV com uh, complete definition of quantum gravity. And there are going to be certain, and in general, we know that the conditions such that you get the semi classical description. Now, the question so the whole point of this lecture, and this is the what I want you to have in the back of your mind as we go through. So the question for today, oh well, for today and Wednesday, I guess, and the hours in between is the following. So my, what I want you to think about and what I want you to sort of be exposed to uh, and see how we can answer is the following. So uh, given this framework, this beautiful non-perturbative uh, definition of quantum gravity, uh, how will you go about Uh, building conformal field theories with the semi-classical gravity features. Okay, so let's say um, we're all mighty powerful. We understand what the space of conformal field theories are. Uh, what will tell you, what will be the diagnostics, what will be the conditions, what are the set of necessary or versus sufficient conditions such that you can say a conformal field theory has a semi-classical limit in which you will have these gravitational features that, that you characterize with ADS. Okay, so how, how could we go about this from a, from a field theory uh, perspective? Can we identify all conformal field theories that satisfy this property? Um, what does it take? And so this is what we're going to explore, okay? So we're going to dive into this quest of trying to understand how will you quantify uh, conformal field theories that smell, <laughs> taste, and look like uh, ADS uh, gravity. Now, in general, this question uh, is pretty difficult. Uh, if I uh, decide to do this in an arbitrary number of dimensions, um, it's, it's a little bit too much, uh, at least for me, and, and for sure for this lectures. Uh, so what we're going to do is that we're going to focus, and this is where the title will come in. We're just going to focus on the instance of ADS3, uh, CFT2. It's kind of interesting, this instance of holography because it's an instance of uh, holography that uh, a lot of things are known about ADS3 quantum gravity. A lot of things are de uh, determined uh, in this context by symmetries. But um, not that much known, not that much is known about specific conformal field theories in two dimensions, like, like precisely what is the strongly coupled conformal field theory that it might be dual to ADS3. So we have some knowledge. Uh, we understand certain aspects of based on uh, string theory constructions and so forth. Uh, but Actually, pinning down this has been a bit uh, difficult compared to ADS-CFT and other dimensions. So uh, we're going to focus on this and we're going to discuss how you would go about building what I'm going to denote a holographic CFT2, okay? So this will be the aim of the, of the talk. And by holographic CFT2, as we're going to refine, basically means a CFT that has the semi-classical uh, gravitational uh, feature. Now, um, so that's the goal, okay? That's going to be the whole theme uh, of uh, this lecture, okay? So how do we set up, what are these conditions? Uh, and basically, and then how do you go about imposing these conditions uh, on conformal field theories and actually telling me, look, this is a theory, this is a specific theory that meets uh, the criteria. So that's, that's what I want to do. So let me outline my idea, my dream of like how this is going to go. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be way too optimistic of how much I'm going to be able to cover, but okay, we'll try, we'll try. Okay, so the outline, I basically divided uh, 
and I think I'll, I'm going to stick to this outline. Uh, I divided my lectures roughly into three parts. Um, and so what I'm going to do, and it's, I hope that uh, I'm, I'm going to cover all, all of this today, uh, is that we're going to start with the gravitational side of things. So I'm going to discuss uh, universal properties of ADS-3 gravity. Because I've been like floating around this notion of like semi-classical gravity and, and, and I want the CFT to capture these features. And it's like, what are these features? So what is it that I'll, I'll be demanding of the CFT? Uh, and so we'll, we'll discuss these are universal properties of ADS-3 gravity and uh, the CFT2 counterparts of uh, some of these statements. This is going to set the, the land for what are going to be the, the conditions. And so things that uh, I'm going to kind of uh, sprinkle on top of you, various topics. We'll talk about perturbative aspects uh, of this theory. So I'll talk about the brown henault uh, result. Uh, we'll discuss also, and no, this is not order, just, <laughs> but it, these are things that are, I'll throw to you at, in different ways. But uh, from the perturbative aspects, we'll talk about the brown henault results. And we'll talk also about how, what we expect from local degrees of freedom uh, in this uh, theory of gravity. Um, we'll also talk about black holes. So, because if you have not met me before, uh, I should tell you I'm a lady that is obsessed with black holes. So we will talk about black holes. We'll talk about the BTZ black hole. Uh, I'll focus mostly uh, for the purposes of today. There's, you can dwell on the BTZ for an entire lifetime, but uh, we don't have that much time. So I'm going to focus on thermodynamic aspects. And uh, most likely today, because I don't think I will have the time, uh, and I might, I think very likely, there's like a 90% chance likelihood uh, that I'll give you a problem uh, while you'll discuss the supersymmetric version of the BT set, uh, because it will become uh, important as we move along. So this might be homework. We'll see if I'm, if I have tons of time, then I'll do it myself. <laughs> if I run out of time, uh, you'll do it yourself. Um, but we'll talk about that. And then along the lines in this uh, thermodynamic uh, discussion, uh, one subject that is going to appear, it will trickle in is what we call the Hawking page transition. Uh, phase transition, sorry. Um, and this, with, with this kind of overview of what I'm describing as universal uh, properties of ADS uh, gravity, uh, the end of this section will basically be that we'll have as round one, basically a, a definition, a first set of conditions for a holographic CFT2. Okay, that will hopefully all happen today. Now, one thing that I like to, I would like you to um, kind of pay attention as you're doing this, and this is the trap of 3D gravity. Um, <laughs> so the warning for this section, which is quite powerful, it's super beautiful. And that's why people love ADS-3 kind of gravity, but it, it also sets for you a trap. Uh, and it's that uh, symmetries are very powerful here. Um, and we'll see this explicitly. Um, but if you, pay, if you look carefully at, at what's going on, it only takes you halfway through, okay? So symmetries are something that allows you to say quite a bit about ADS-CFT and how the correspondence works, but we need, you need a bit more, okay? So, uh, and this is just to warn you that if you were not aware about it before, uh, not 
all CFTs, CFT2s, although they will share the symmetries and they will share many basic aspects that you might think, oh, they smell like ADS uh, gravity. Uh, not any CFT2 will lead to a holographic CFT2, okay? So um, this is why it's good to kind of set up what are these set of conditions very explicitly and they're non-trivial conditions to be met. Very good. Then um, with that in mind, uh, maybe by the end of today, we'll start talking about what is going to be our strategy. So given that I'll uh, flesh out what are these universal properties, uh, then comes, okay, great. So you have these conditions, um, how are you supposed to implement them? And so we're, I'm going to describe to you how we will explore the space of conformal uh, field theories. Uh, I will have to, and then and impose those and how we are thinking about imposing uh, restrictions. So we will have to make uh, some sacrifices. Uh, we do not know, like spoiler, <laughs> We do not know what the space of 2D conformal field theories are. So I'll, I'll have to live with that one day maybe. Uh, and so we'll discuss a bit uh, in this part, basically um, what are the challenges um, and known aspects. Um, I'll basically start uh, discussing how we're going to focus. So given that I don't know the whole space of conformal field theories, uh, this is going to be some part of my compromise. We'll focus on, on CFTs that are called uh, symmetric product orbifolds. I'll try to motivate why that is. You will be the judge if I motivated correctly. And then also as a good string theorist, uh, we'll also focus on supersymmetric quantities um, for reasons that also will become clear uh, as we move along, but okay. But given our technology, given how much we can uh, describe and capture these conformal field theories, this will be what we'll have. Uh, as we go through here, there will be a round two because I will have to make some compromises uh, there will be a round two of definitions. Uh, so more conditions on holographic, no, holographic CFT2. And it will be basically based because I'm, I'm making these choices um, on what are the types of theories that I'll, I'll um, study. And the, the theme here is that the reason why I'm making all these choices is because I'm a control freak. So it's all about control, 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 okay? So I want to control as many aspects as I can of the conformal field theory so that I can be precise if they actually describe semi-classical features or not. Okay. And then the third part uh, of the lectures Uh, will be the implementation. And I really hope I will get to this part with some uh, reasonable amount uh, of time uh, because this is where you will say, oh, you made all these sacrifice. You're putting yourself in a corner. Uh, there, if, you, if you do that sometimes in life, you can find yourself with the result being the empty set, which is not very exciting. Uh, but what I want to tell you is that maybe despite the fact that you might think that the restrictions in my strategy are too tight. Uh, they are, uh, they're not the most general, general type of conformal field theories, but the thing that was nice that as a control freak, uh, they actually gave us the power to carry out a classification. So within the set of theories uh, that we're considering, uh, the bottom line is that we have a classification. And this is what I want to tell you how we go about 
uh, classifying the space of theories. And so we basically made a classification of the space of, uh, this is a mouthful, but it's basically of supersymmetric, symmetric product, uh, orbifolds. And so we can tell you, you give me a supersymmetric symmetric product orbifold, and I will spell out, yes, it smells holographic. No, it does not smell holographic. No, this will never lead to a semi-classical description of ADS3 gravity. So I can, I will not be maybe, no, but the answer will be yes or no, which is great, it's exciting, um, it's new. And so I want to share that excitement with you. Um, and for that, I will have to introduce a bit of mathematics. So we'll discuss at some length, maybe briefly, because I might be running out of time, um, but we will be discussing uh, what are known, what we were calling single paramodular forms. So this is basically a way on how we describe um, the spectrum. And then as we go through these rounds of conditions, so then we'll implement. So I'll tell you how we implement round one of conditions, and then we'll discuss the implementation uh, of round two. Okay. And the punchline here, um, although I might, I will definitely give you the punchline. I might not be able to show it to you in full detail, but the papers, I will give you references. So if I don't have the time to go through all the steps uh, and the proof uh, and how we built the classification, uh, one thing that I will do for, I will manage to, uh, I will say it and I will write it, is that the punchline is that we were uh, able to build an infinite uh, family of candidate holographic CFT2s. And so as a young student that is full of energy and is looking for something to work on, um, oh, sorry. Um, what you should be thinking of. So I'll present to you the outcome of these lectures is that you will have at your disposal a whole family of, of these holographic CFTs. And so the question is, and which are based on imposing some set of necessary conditions. Uh, uh, but one of the important challenges in this arena, we'll, we'll discuss them when we come at the end, is basically, uh, were these just a set of necessary conditions? Are they sufficient? Uh, if you start noticing that there's other conditions that you need to impose on these uh, conformal field theories, would it shrink this infinite family? Or by imposing the set of conditions that we impose, you're guaranteed to have everything else that you dream and desire uh, of the correspondence as we know it. Uh, so this will come basically, yeah. So by the end, as we discuss the implications of this, we'll conclude and kind of talk about some outlook. So I'm sure you guys will have tons of questions. Okay, very good. So with that, all that said, um, let's get started. So we'll start with our first part. And I'm going to assume there's no questions so far because I've been just overviewing what's happening. No. Okay, but okay, in any case, if you do as uh, Paul was saying, if you have a question, uh, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so part one. Um, let's talk about this universal properties. Radius three gravity. Okay. If I'm going, um, for some of you, I suspect that this will go very slow. For some of you, I might be, if you're not very familiar with some of these things, 
I might be going too fast. So this is where uh, you set up the pace by asking me questions. If I don't get any questions, I'll just be like, Psh! and then just go through it very quickly. Okay. Um, but well, we'll see. Okay, so what do I have in mind? So let's, uh, every time uh, we state a theory, like, okay, so what is the theory that I have in mind? This theory of ADS3 gravity. So I have in mind that I have an action, a 3D action. And what I want to describe uh, in terms of holography is something quite simple. So I want to describe an action that is nothing more than the einstein hilbert action. Um, so here I have in mind, so this is our beloved uh, einstein hilbert action with a negative cosmological constant, okay, uh, where L is the ADS3 radius and GN is Newton's constant, also known as the Planck length, has units of length in 3D. And what I have in mind is a theory that will always have this at, at low energy. So when uh, G Newton uh, is going to zero. The semi-classical description will contain the Einstein-Hilbert term, uh, but it also I can uh, consider I can add more things to this theory. So I don't I don't want uh, just the Einstein-Hilbert term, but I could have other fields. Uh, I could have what I'll call matter, just very colloquially. Sort of I can I'm thinking here that I could have stuff like I could have scalars in my theory. Uh, I could have gauge fields. Uh, sorry, Alejandro, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you write slightly bigger, please? Slightly bigger, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, perfect. Uh, okay, very good. Um, let me see that you're seeing it correctly. Ah, yeah, you still see the full screen? Uh, okay, great. Okay, so you have... Um, so you have a scalar field, gauge fields, um, and you will have, you can also have fermions, which means that you could think of this making, constructing your favorite, for instance, supergravity, since I'm going to refer to supersymmetric stuff, but okay, you, I'm not restricting to just this. Now, the, um, uh, this will be in, in some sense, the effective field theories that I'll be considering as I'm, uh, Denoting, this is what I'll colloquially denote a semi-classical uh, gravity. Now, in terms of uh, jargon, um, let me just sort of be clear. Um, this part, so if you don't have matter uh, in the absence of all these scalars and gauge fields and whatever other things might come, if you are a string theorist, it will come in your string compactification, uh, but, uh, in the dream world where you don't get distracted by this matter, uh, this part of the action, the Einstein-Hilbert action, it it's what people tend to call uh, pure ADS-3 gravity, okay? So it is a gravitational theory uh, described by the Einstein-Hilbert term and nothing else, okay? So let's talk first then uh, about that theory, okay? So let's focus... Uh, because most of the things that I will uh, view as universal, um, they come just because of this gravitational part uh, of the action. The matter uh, will not uh, play uh, an important role. Yes. Uh, Alejandro, there is a question in the chat for you. Are you going to be working in Euclidean signature? Um, depends on what I'm doing. And sometimes I'll write things. For now, I think, uh, most of the stuff I'll do is in Laurentian, but uh, some of the thermodynamic stuff, it's convenient to do it in Euclidean. But for the next 20 minutes or so, the metrics will be written in Laurentian signature. Okay. Uh, good. So 
Um, so let's focus. Let's just try to understand a little bit uh, what's happening uh, on the gravitational side of things. Okay, let me, it's too bad that when I zoom out like that, then you guys, okay, but I'll write bigger. It's just that I want to see the whole page on my screen. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll promise I'll, I'll write bigger. Uh, okay. So let's focus then on this pure ADS-3 sector, okay? So if, you, if this is the theory that you have, uh, if you only have ADS-3 gravity, uh, there's some uh, fun facts about it. Uh, it's a topological theory. Uh, this means in the gravitational uh, context, well, topological here means there's no local uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, and this means basically that if you're on shell, meaning if you solve the equations of motion for that part of the gravitational action, which is this set of equations, um, so as you solve for those equations, then the Riemann tensor of any solution uh, that your heart desires uh, will be basically completely fixed by the metric. Okay, so that's what it means in this context for the theory to be uh, topological. The Riemann tensor, there's no, well, it's a consequence that the Weyl tensor uh, in three dimensions automatically vanishes. It's always trivial. And then if you impose the Einstein's equations, then the Riemann tensor is completely fixed. So there's no data that you have to uh, play around with. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't mean, uh, so for a long, very long time, uh, people didn't pay too much attention to this theory because it looked uh, kind of boring, like there were no uh, gravitons per se in the sense of like local propagation, uh, but still um, <clears throat> this theory has, a, the solution space is very rich. Of 3D gravity is uh, non-trivial. Okay, so for instance, uh, some things that we're going to encounter uh, as we move along, uh, there will be perturbative states. Uh, which people tend to call the boundary gravitons. as we'll uh, show. Uh, there's also, these are a little bit more tricky, but um, they, they're there. Um, I'm not going to discuss them much today, but there will be also particles, uh, which are uh, basically defects, uh, conical defects. And what's going to be important for us uh, for the purposes of this lecture is that there are black holes which basically are uh, solutions that are topologically distinct. So one of the important, so you can say that locally, so when I wrote down the Riemann tensor there, it, uh, it dictates to you what are the properties of the geometry locally, but it doesn't tell you about global aspects of the, of the solution of the manifold. And so you still have topology uh, to play around with. And that's why this theory uh, still contains uh, black holes. So let's, uh, let's describe basically how these space times look like. And this will be convenient uh, to set up some notation and start uh, discovering uh, ADS uh, CFT. So, um, so what's convenient in terms of packaging uh, 
uh, is basically by what in the area is called the language of, uh, so it's using uh, the language of asymptotic symmetries. Okay, so what am I, uh, what is the statement? So basically, um, so I'm going to write down a metric, which I will consider the most general solution, uh, but it's the most general solution provided some set of boundary conditions. Uh, so you can never talk about like, well, it's kind of awkward to talk about spaces of solutions if you have not dictated what is some boundary condition that you're imposing uh, on, on your differential equations. So this is no different in this context. So, um, so the most general solution, and usually we impose boundary conditions at an asymptotic boundary. So the most general solution to pure ADS3, which obeys, and this is where it's very important that I'm specifying what are my boundary conditions. So these are known. I'll, I'll show you where they come in. To base brown no boundary conditions is the following metric. So this is a convenient way to write it. So let me. So the line element it has a radial piece. And it will be parameterized by two arbitrary functions. Uh, like this. Okay. So here I have. Two arbitrary functions of the each of them of x plus and x minus respectively. Okay. Now to illustrate uh, where the boundary conditions come in and writing uh, this line element, uh, let's do um, a large R expansion. So this is an exact solution um, for any of these arbitrary functions. This will solve the Einstein's equations, the ones, so this, this line element here, it's a solution to this equation, okay? No dot, 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 it's an exact solution for any profile of L minus and L plus. Um, and, uh, but asymptotically, so if we expand this at large R, so okay, so that term, I'll write it the same, but the large R expansion of the rest, so it's convenient to write it like this because it will resonate with higher dimensional uh, versions of ADS CFT. So, I hope I'm not writing too small again. Uh, it's okay. Okay. A little bit, maybe. Okay. I don't know. Um, so, Alejandra, in about five minutes might be a good time to take a break, if that's okay with you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, then I'll finish saying a few words about this line element. So, if I'm expanding this, uh, in series of like in, in expansion in R, then uh, the statement is that, uh, so this is what people will call like a, Be a Pfefferman Graham expansion. And this term over here, it's what's usually denoted as the boundary metric. Okay, and this is where the brown henault boundary conditions come in. So what Brown-Hanau will tell you is that as you look, as you quantify the phase space 
uh, this object will be fixed. I picked it to be just a flat uh, metric in this case. You can generalize this if you have, if you want to put at the boundary a different metric that is not just flat. Uh, and then this part over here, uh, this is what in, in the notation of a Pfefferman Graham expansion will be what people call like G2AB. And as we'll see, it will be related to the um, to the stress tensor. Okay, as we go through the to the boundary stress tensor, as we go through it. Okay, so um, okay, so let's uh, and this notation maybe things look a bit weird, so it's useful to go through some examples uh, of like what are space times that maybe you're familiar with and how do they look like in this uh, in, in this way of writing the space time. So for instance, um, if you wanted to tell, uh, say, okay, what is ADS3 and let's say Poincaré coordinates, that's the easiest one. So that will correspond to L minus uh, equal to zero and L plus uh, equal to zero. And so then the line element becomes really easy. Uh, it's just L squared dr squared over r squared minus r squared dx plus uh, dx minus. Uh, I would call x plus and x minus, they're basically uh, null uh, directions. And uh, this is basically the picture that I was drawing at the beginning. So let's say here's t. Here's x, and this is the r direction. Okay, so that's ADS uh, and point correct coordinates. Then, uh, last, well, before the break, uh, let's do ADS three and global coordinates. So, in this language, it will be this function L minus equal to minus a quarter and this function of L plus also equal to uh, minus a quarter. And the line element now, uh, I'll change. I'll tell you in a second, what is the definition of rho? Um, but here x plus minus is t plus minus phi. Uh, R in the, in the original metric is now L over two times e to the row over L. And the shape of the space time, let's see if I can get, no, different sizes of cylinders, <laughs> bottom and top. Uh, so this is when ADS, uh, ah, I'll manage. Don't worry. No, I didn't manage. Okay, it will be, a, I'll fix the cylinder uh, <laughs> when we're <laughs> offline. Um, but basically, um, this is the direction phi. So phi here is periodic with period uh, two pi. Uh, time goes up and time the other way around. Um, this is rough. Okay, so it's a solid. Uh, cylinder. So that's global uh, ADS. And perfect timing. Um, we could take a break and then we'll talk about then another solution uh, in this uh, context. Okay. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, so I think we probably have time for one or two quick questions before the break. If anyone has a question on Zoom. So I was going too slowly. It's too basic, guys. Should I step it up? Uh, yeah, we'll see that basically there. Um, so yeah, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, that will be basically the next thing. Um, well, roughly, we'll talk about the black hole and then we'll see what are the residual symmetries. So what are the set of transformations that preserve this form and what happens to these functions L uh, as you change them? 
uh, as you act with these residual symmetries. There will be basically the control the values of the charges associated to those uh, transformations. Okay, so if we have no more questions, then maybe we'll uh, continue again at uh, 1035. So that's in nine minutes.